Amen. So tonight I'm going to continue on a series I started several weeks ago. I was preaching through this on Sunday mornings, if you recall, the analogies of of the Bible. We looked at the different things that the Bible is likened unto, that uh, the way it illustrates itself within the Scripture. And I won't take the time to go over all that, but because we did preach the uh, Mother's Day sermon, I did want to get this in. I probably have one more, I think, after this that I'm, I'd like to do. But tonight we're going to look at how the Bible is likened unto both a sword and a shield. A sword and a shield. You might have picked that up there in Ephesians 6. It says in verse 17, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we can see that the Bible is likened unto the sword, uh, a sword, which it's called the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. So we're making application again about how the Bible is likened unto a particular object, and today it's being likened unto a sword. And a sword and a shield, and we'll see a shield a little bit later, uh, a, a sword and a shield are what? These are weapons again, right? These are offensive and defensive weapons. The sword, of course, is the offense. The shield is the defense. And what the Bible is showing us, I believe, is that if, if we learn to use the Scripture, it, it, we're going to be uh, equipped to fight the spiritual battle that we've been called to. The Bible is going to help us, as Paul told Timothy, do what? War a good warfare, spiritually. That's what Paul told Timothy. You don't have to go there, but it says in 1 Timothy 1, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. So what was going to be his... How was Timothy going to war his good warfare? It was through the prophecies that went before on him. <clears throat> and of course, we know that was referring to Paul's preaching and perhaps the preaching of others that he heard. And what was the preaching? The preaching was the preaching of the Word of God. So the Word of God is what was, uh, and its preaching was what was going to help Timothy to fight that battle that he's been called to, that we've all been called to, that spiritual battle that we've all been called to is uh, we're equipped through the Word of God. So the Scripture is our God-given spiritual weapon, and it can be trusted to fight that battle. And this is a battle that we all have been called to, and it's one that we need to get involved in. It's one that we can't just stand passively and uh, by and just let others fight. You know, the battle has come to us in many ways. In our, in our personal lives, uh, you know, the devil, we are uh, his enemy if we're saved. And God has given us a weapon to fight back with, and it's called the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. So the first thing I want to point out is the fact that the sword, again, being offensive weapon, shows us that we are to be, uh, as Christians, there is supposed to be an offensive attack. Again, we're not passive here. We are offensive. We're not just you know hunkering down. We want to go out and actually, you know, take back and, and attack the enemy and take back those that are held captive by him. We want to free people. We want to liberate them through the preaching of what? Of the word of God. So the word of God is our weapon. And that's a very assuring thing. Uh, you know, if you were sent into a battle, a physical one, and someone, you know, said, hey, you're going to go fight this war, you know, here's a slingshot. You'd probably, you know, well, the guy's got an AK, <laughs> you know. Can I get one of those? Sorry. This is all we got. You, you probably wouldn't be that bold, would you? You'd probably be trying to hide behind something or run away if your weapon couldn't be trusted, if you had a, you know, something weak to go fight this enemy. So the fact that the Bible is likened unto a sword should give us boldness. It should give us confidence because we've been given a, a, a weapon that can be trusted. That, as we'll see later, is mighty and, and, and is, is sharper than any two-edged sword. Excuse me. And why is it that it can be trusted? Why can we trust the Word of God? Because it is a sword that has been forged by God. It's been forged by God. He is the one that has made this weapon. That's how we can have trust in it. And it can be trusted. Just like we wouldn't want to go into some battle with some weapon, you know, that had a bad reputation of, you know, falling apart. You know, we don't, we, we want to carry a weapon to protect ourselves you know, we want to find a, a reliable weapon, one that can be trusted, which is why we all carry Glocks, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just made some people mad. I got a few thumbs up. All right. Why? Why is that the brand that people like to carry? And there's other ones, right? Because it's just, it, it's not pretty, you know, but it, it's, it's, it can be trusted. It's tested. 
Well, the word of God can be trusted. And, it, it, you know, we're fighting a, a real battle where we need to be able to trust the weapon that we've been given. How do we know it can be trusted? Well, because through its inspiration. If you would, go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look, we're not going to look at any new scripture. These are all going to be things that we've been, uh, have probably heard before, but there are things that we have to be reminded of. These are things that we have to remind ourselves of, that we have a weapon in the Word of God. We have a sword that is meant for us to take to the enemy. And people, you know, that's, that's asking people to go put themselves out there. You're asking people to be bold. You're asking people to take courage, to take heart, and go fight a battle. If you want to inspire people to do that, one way is to remind them, hey, you have a weapon that can be trusted. Not just can be trusted, but is effective. That will push back the enemy. That will uh, win battles for us. The Bible says in John 14, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom my Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. We can trust the Word of God because it is inspired by God. We can trust this weapon because of the fact that the Holy Spirit brought to remembrance those things that Christ spoke unto the apostles, and then they were written down. He said in John 16, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he, shall, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. This is how you know you could trust the word of God, because of the fact that it is divinely inspired by God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Now we have received not that spirit, the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. He's saying, look, the things that we have received, the things which we speak, are the things which the Holy Ghost has taught us. How do you know you can trust this weapon tonight? Because of its inspiration. Because it is God-given. You're there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, you look at verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It says all scripture is what? Given by inspiration of God. It's God breathed. That's how you know you have a weapon you can trust. This wasn't a book that was just written up by men somewhere who just got together and said, well, this sounds nice. You know, this will give people some good morals. This will keep people from tearing each other apart. No, this is something that, uh, this is a book that was given to us through the Holy Ghost that God inspired through the events that took place that men were moved to write these things. And God has given them to us. Why? That the man of God, verse 17, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And that work, you know, we have a work that we're called to. That, you know, who wouldn't call warfare work? Who wouldn't call, you know, ask a soldier if he works for a living when he goes out and fights a battle. I mean, that's why they pay him. And look, we've been called to that battle. We have a work to do. So God has equipped us through the word of God, to go out and fight that battle. And I'm telling you this tonight, it is a weapon that can be trusted, that is powerful because of the fact that it is inspired. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's why you have these all authors that just down through the centuries who lived at different times from different backgrounds are all testifying in the same thing. It's miraculous. There's no other book like it. It's inspired. and It's our weapon to go out and fight a spiritual battle. The, sport, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, can be trusted tonight because it's inspired and because it is preserved. Go over to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. The Bible says in Psalm 12, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Either that's the truth or David's lying. Either God's words have been preserved from that gener from every, for every generation or they haven't. And there's a lot of people out there that want to cause, call, uh, you know, bring, uh, cause you to doubt. In the King James Bible, they want you to doubt in the, in the preserved word of God. By saying, oh, we, we found some, some fragments of here that, you know, that have been buried for thousands of years that seem to say something a little different. Well, how do you know that can you found them in wasn't the trash? <laughs> Are you telling me God's word has been buried somewhere for thousands of years? 
that's not what David said. David said that they would be purified and that he would keep them. He would preserve them. That God's word would always be available to man. He said, forever thy word is settled in heaven, in Psalm 119. Jesus said in Matthew 5, Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law to all be fulfilled. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So was David lying? Was Jesus lying? And they said that God's words were going to be preserved for us? We could trust this book, this, this weapon, this sword that we've been given to fight the spiritual battle because it has been inspired and because God has preserved it for us. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 40, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. This is a weapon that's never going to fail. This is a weapon that's never going to have to be retired and put away and you're going to have to get a new model. This weapon is always going to work every single time. You're never going to, you know, you're never going to be in the middle of the fight, try, you know, and you got a jam. You have to take it apart and clean it. It's a spiritual weapon that is always ready to go and it's always going to be there. It is never going to fail. That's what he's saying. Our, the, it's going to stand forever. That's the book that we read. That's the sword that we wield. The word of God can be trusted. And in fact, it must be trusted. You say, well, I trust it. Well, that's good because you need to. You need to trust the word of God tonight. Why, is the God, why does God liken his word unto a sword? Why does he liken it unto an offensive weapon? Why does he liken it unto a shield? Because you are, whether you realize or not, involved in a spiritual battle. Not only can you trust the word of God, you must trust the word of God tonight. Let me give you several reasons why you must trust the word of God tonight. Because of the strength of our enemy. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. People hear the preacher get up and say, oh, yeah, the spiritual battle, yeah, it's, he's really waxing eloquent up there. Am I? Or is this a, a reality that we all need to face? Or are we really actually involved in a spiritual battle? Maybe one that we can't see necessarily with our eyes, but one that is very real. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because that's just a good way to live your life. Because that's just what God tells you to do. No, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. That's a real enemy. Look, if a, if a lion walked in the room, <laughs> I'd be up on that piano. <laughs> You'd never see me move so quick. Now I'm kidding. I'd dive in front of the kids, right? Now I'd dive behind the kids. I don't know. But the point is, if a real live lion walked in here, we'd all probably take note. There would be some kind of reaction. <clears throat> Let me tell you something. You have one. There's one walking around. There's a spiritual lion, an adversary that's always walking about. That always has its eye on you. That's always licking its chops, looking for a chance to pounce and sink its teeth in. And, uh, you know, I've, every time I read this or preach about it, I bring it up, but I just remember hearing somebody say, oh, well, you know, that lion, he's a toothless lion. He can't hurt anybody because you're, you're in Christ. No, <laughs> that's not true. He, he's got teeth, and he can bite. And there are people, there are Christians that have had their lives destroyed, that have been bitten, that have been devoured, that are maimed permanently by the devil. Because they thought, well, that whole thing about being vigilant, that whole thing about being sober, you know, that's for, you know, that's for the preacher. That's for, you know, so-and-so. No, it's for everybody because we're all involved in this fight. We're all uh, soldiers for Christ. We're all on the front lines, and he is a very real enemy, and he is strong. That's why it says in verse 9, whom resist steadfast in the faith. We need to resist him. You know, just, just the, the connotation there is that if you have to resist him, that means he's putting pressure on you. You have to push back. That's what it means to resist. And we always want to say, well, yeah, it's the job of the preacher to get up and, and call out, you know, the, the sin of this world and take a strong, strong stand for Christ and not back down and not compromise. And that's all true. But this applies to all of us. This is something we all have to endeavor to do in our personal lives. Whom resist steadfast in the faith? 
You know, I wonder how, sometimes how easy it is for, God, for the devil to just push people over. Don't read your Bible today. I'm not going to read my Bible today. Yeah. Just, just rolls us right over. Don't bother praying. These are the attacks that he, I mean, what do we, how do you think he attacks? He's going to show up with a pitchfork in his hand and a little red suit like Porky the Pig or something and chase you around? It begins in the mind. You don't need to pray. You don't need to read your Bible. You don't need to go to church. You don't need to go soul winning. You don't need to do this. You don't need to do that. That preacher, he's off, he's off his, his rocker on that. That's not what the Bible, you know, sowing seeds of doubt, sowing seeds of discord, getting us from, uh, not, from doing the things that we need to do to press toward that mark, as we preach Thursday. Getting us to back down, to not resist, to just give him the ground in our, spirit, in our lives spiritually. That's how the devil attacks and just a little bit at a time, gains a little bit of ground every day, a little bit more, a little bit more. Go over to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. We have an enemy. Why do you have to trust the word, of, uh, the sword of the Spirit? Why must you trust the word of God? Because of the enemy and because of the strength of that enemy tonight. He's like that roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 says, For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, just transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed in an angel of light. That's our enemy. Spiritual wickedness in high places. The devil transforming himself into an angel of light, preaching a false gospel. The Bible says in 1 John 2, little children, it is the last time. This is in John's day. How much later is the hour for us? It is the last time. As ye have heard that an Antichrist shall come. You know, people get so worked up. When is the Antichrist going to come? When he gets here. <laughs> you know, it's like those like kids, are we there yet? Are we there yet? No. We'll be there when we get there. The Antichrist will come when he comes. But even now, why don't we focus more on this fact, that even now, at this present moment, now, there are many Antichrists in the world. Why should you take the time to learn the Word of God? Why should you take the time to learn how this weapon works and to yield it, or to wield it, rather? Because even now, there are many Antichrists. Even now, Satan has already transformed himself into an angel of light. The Bible says where you are in 2 Timothy 3, verse 13, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. It's going to get easier. Is that what the Bible says? The Bible says it's going to get worse and worse. Doing what? Deceiving and being deceived. Pulling the wool over people's eyes. Preaching uh, lies and falsehoods and false gospels. This is how he's going to work. And that's already taking place. We see it all the time. I left to come over here on Friday, you know, drop off the stuff for the tea party and go on that hike. Back it out of my driveway in the big yellow church van. It says Faithful Word Baptist Church right across it. I look across the park. There's three Mormon elders. <laughs> By elders, I mean like 16, 17, 18. I don't know. how They, they look like kids because they were. And they all get out, and I, I thought, oh, great, the morons. I mean, the Mormons. I thought, do I stop? Do I yell at them? Do I roll down the window and tell them that Brigham Young was a pedophile who was burning in hell? Whoops, did I say that? It's true. <laughs> he was and is. I said, no, I got to get going. But then I looked over, and they're all, they all, and like, like all in unison, raise their hands and start waving. I, and I'm thinking, just this all happens in a split second. I think, well, I can't just let them wave at me and not do anything. They're going to think that, oh, because this is what, this is the Mormons, this is their shtick. We're like you. We're Christians. They, and that what that is is a need to persuade, because what they believe is so weird, they need to convince themselves that they're normal. By saying, we're like you, right? We're like you, right? We're not that weird, right? No, you're that weird. You believe some really weird stuff. <clears throat> so they're waving at me. I said, well, I can't let them get away with that. So I just went. <laughs> just drove right by. went. Thumbs down. Big, nasty face. So that, that, I, I said, I hope that ruined their day. I hope that discouraged them. I said, well, that's not nice to say. Yeah, but... They're going to go preach a false gospel. 
They're going to go bring another Christ. The Bible says if, if, if you know, they bring another Christ, let him be accursed. If any man preach any other gospel, uh, a gospel than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. <laughs> he said, if any come unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his e evil deeds. So what if I just went, oh, <laughs> I know you believe a false gospel, but you know, I'm sure you, you don't mean it. No. Boo. You stink. Get saved. Get out of that cult. I hope it ruined their day. <clears throat> But, you know, the battle's real. We have to learn to, I don't know what that had to do with this sermon, but, you know, there is a real spiritual battle out there. The Mormons are going out knocking the door, spreading their false gospel. The Seventh-day Adventists are out there pre preaching their lies. The, uh, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're out there. <clears throat> there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of falsehoods in this country today. There's a lot of uh, false religion in the United States today. It's important that we learn how to use this word, how to, how to swing the sword up here and out in the streets and in our lives. Why? So that we can fight the battle that's been brought to our door because of the strength and the reality of the enemy. We need to learn to do it because of the severity of the battle's outcome. It's a, there's severity in the outcome. It's a, there's a finality for the people that are involved in this battle. Look, we know that ultimately because we're saved through Christ, through, by grace we're saved, we understand that we're going to win the war, <clears throat> but we could lose some battles along the way. And there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be lost for eternity. There's going to be a lot of people that are just, they're going to suffer dire consequences because of the battle that is taking place right now spiritually. Go over to Hebrews chapter 2. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Look, if we decide I'm not going to fight this battle, I'm not going to swing the sword, I'm going to put my light under a bushel, we'll still be saved, we'll still go to heaven, but there's going to be people that are, are going to be, be lost and remain lost because we chose to hide the gospel and not preach it. And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe, believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That's what we're doing when we go out and preach the gospel. We are shining the light of the glorious gospel of Christ in a dark place. The lost, they are in bondage right now. They have, there is an eternal consequence to this battle. They, the, the, the outcome is severe. There are going to be casualties. We want to bring those numbers down. We can't get them all. But let's bring them down. The lost remain eternally lost. The lost are going to, even in the meantime, remain in bondage through what? Through the fear of the enemy. And that last enemy that shall be destroyed is what? Death. <clears throat> the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the, had the power of death. Who had the power of death before Christ? Satan. That's, a, that's an enemy. Look, don't let Elton John lie to you. It's the circle of life. Like death is just some, you know, it's just, you know, it's just part of life. The Bible says it's an enemy. That's what the Bible says. It's a curse. God didn't create man to die. It was something that because of man, by one man sin entered the world and, death, and sin passed upon all men. And, and death passed upon all men. I know I'm kind of butchering that one. But that's the, that's the reality of death. Death isn't just, you know, the circle of life, whatever they told you in whatever Disney movie. The Bible says it's an enemy and that Satan wields the power of it. It says that's why he, uh, he took part of the same, the flesh and blood. That's why he came and was manifest in the flesh that through his death, right, through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil. Verse 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. There's some people, they're just subject to the bondage of death. You know, lost people don't like to think about death because it scares them to death. <laughs> it's frightening. They put it out of their minds as much as they can. They don't want to think about it. I find myself thinking about it 
And I think, well, it, how bad would it, could it really be? I think about, oh, well, you know, hopefully I get to love a long life and see a lot of things and do great things for God and, and see my family grow and all that stuff. But I don't, I don't worry about it. I don't worry about dying. I hope it's, you know, quick and painless. I hope a lot of people come to the funeral. <laughs> hope you guys eat good. You know, <clears throat> I don't sit there and bite my nails over it. Why? Because I've been delivered from the power of death. But there's people out there, they're in bondage right now. They're, they're spiritual POWs, right? The Satan's got them in, in, the, in the concentration camp, and they're afraid. And we can show up, and we can liberate them. We can liberate them from that fear of death. Through what? Through the sword of the Spirit, through an offensive attack, through taking the Bible and preaching the gospel of Christ. We need to trust the Word of God. You can trust the Word of God. You must trust the Word of God, this weapon, this sword that God has given us, because of the severity of the battle's outcome, because of the lost <clears throat> and, their <clears throat> and the fact that they're going to be remain lost, and because of the fact that they are even now in bondage through fear, we also must trust it because of the fact that a lot of Christians out there are already defeated. You know, we can go out and we can liberate the lost, but what about the backslidden Christian? You tell me there isn't somebody in this town somewhere, some Christian, who knows he should be in church that isn't? He's out there. They're out there. And if we would just take this sword and go find them, we could bring them back. We could say, hey, let's, let's get in the battle with us. Let's put a sword in your hands. <clears throat> Defeated Christians, and I don't have time to develop that point. You must learn to trust the Word of God tonight because there is no other weapon. There's no other weapon besides this one. This is the weapon God has given you. Go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. This is the quintessential verse about the fact, of, 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 you know, describing how the Bible is like and unto a sword. It says right there in verse 12, for the word of God is quick. What does quick mean in the Bible? It means alive. It's living. The quick and the dead. He's the judge of the quick and the dead. He's not just saying the Bible's fast, you know. Sometimes the Bible, you know, it, you read through it, it takes some time to get through it, right? But it's quick. It has power, right? It is quick and powerful. You know, and that's one of the greatest testimonies, the fact that the Bible is the Word of God, is the power that it has. I mean, you read the Word of God and just in your devotions, and sometimes it just, just hits you right in the heart. You say, wow, what a book. It's amazing. The Word of God is quick. It's alive. It's, it's powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and as and the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Bible has a way when we read it or we hear it preached of just searching our hearts. God takes it and through his Holy Spirit just, you know, shows us what's in our own hearts. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts. It can convict us. It can encourage us. It can motivate us. It can make us get right. It can do all kinds of things. It's quick. It's powerful. It's alive. It's a weapon, and there's no other weapon given. It's the only one that we have. God hasn't, you know, don't let the Mormons fool you. There isn't another book besides the King. They're going to show up with the King James, say, oh, we believe this. This is our book. And then in their little bag or whatever, they're going to pull out, you know, Pearl of Great Price, Doctrines and Covenants, and whatever, whatever stupid books they're going to pull out. <clears throat> there's the only weapon this is the only weapon that's given. And you know why that is? Because it's the only weapon you need. It's the only weapon you need. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. If I have a weapon that's quick and powerful like the Bible is, why do I need anything else? And that's a good point to remember, you know, when we are out preaching the gospel, when we are out soul winning and knocking doors. It's the Word of God that's going to do the heavy lifting for us. Yes, we need to explain it. Yes, we need to ask questions and make sure people are staying with us and that they're tracking. But give them the Word of God. You know, if they're willing, even if they seem they're like, you know, a little bit of a, a scoffer or a mocker, if they're willing to at least hear the Bible preached, preach it. Take the time because that's the, what's going to do the work. Not just our logic, not just through our, you know, the powers of argument. 
because we're good at debating about some topic, that's not going to get people saved. Because the word of God is what's quick. The word of God is what's powerful. The word of God is what's going to divide asunder and discern the thoughts and tents of their hearts. <clears throat> there is no other weapon given because there is no other weapon needed. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. It's mighty through God. God's given us this weapon, and he's empowered it. And in verse 5, it can, what is, look at what it does. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. <clears throat> we have a very powerful offensive weapon that can be trusted because it's inspired, that can be trusted because it's preserved, and must be trusted because it's the only weapon you have and it's the only weapon that you need to fight a very real spiritual battle. So not only is the sword of God a spiritual offensive weapon, but it's a sword, it's also a shield. It's a sword and a shield. Now the word of God provides us, and I'm not going to take a lot of time to develop this point, but the word of God provides us shelter, doesn't it? Because, you know, a lot of times we need shelter, don't we? You know, even, even the, when, when things are going well in some warfare, the battle, you know, they have to stop at some point and rest. They have to stop at some point and refuel and get the water and supplies that they need to before they can push on. And sometimes the, the battle gets a little hot and they have to maybe pull back a little bit and regroup and take shelter. The Word of God, yes, it's an offensive weapon, but it's also a defensive weapon. It's a shield. That's what he said in the beginning there. He said in Ephesians, uh, and above all, taking the shield of faith, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. Where, where, uh, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You know, that faith is, or that shield is our faith, but what is our faith in? It's in the word of God. It's in the word of God. So the shield of our faith, that is our trust in the word of God. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 30, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Right, so God is our shield, but it goes on and says in verse six, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. How does God shield us? How does God shelter us from the fiery darts of the wicked? Wicked, Through his word. And we just have to learn to trust it. Our faith in his word is that shield. That's what makes it a shield, the fact that we trust it. So we must believe that God has provided us a shield in the word of God. The Bible says, if you're still there, it probably, you've probably moved on. You can just listen. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. <clears throat> but God will, who, will not suffer, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. That's a promise from the word of God, isn't it? And look, we're going to face temptations. We're going to face trials. We're gonna, there's no such temptation as taking you, but such as is common to man. You know, it's a common thing for men and, and, and for man to be tempted and to go through trials, and to face struggles. That's part of the Christian life. That's part of this battle that we're involved in. But we have this promise here in the Word of God that God is faithful and will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. Oh, I just had to give in. It was too intense. I couldn't take it. No, the Bible says if you're not tempted above that you are able, that you would be able to withstand it if what? But will with that temptation also make a way to escape. You know, whenever we're in that place of temptation, whether it's to do sin or maybe, you know, we're being persecuted in some way, we're going through some trial, we're, we feel like we're losing the battle, right? If, if when we're in that, that, that hot part of the battle, you know, if we would just by faith look around and ask God to show us, he would show us what? A way of escape. A way of escape. It's just sometimes that way of escape isn't very glorious, isn't it? It's not like some, you know, movie where the underdog, you know, comes back in the 10th round and just socks it to the guy and everyone goes, the, you know, everyone's got him up on their shoulders. Ah. A lot of times the temptations and trials we go through, a lot of people don't even know we're going through them. So if we get the victory, no one's really going to recognize it. No one's going to really, you know, hey, good job and slap us on the back. Because a lot of times that way of escape is through what? Getting on your face before God. 
getting in the Word of God. You know, there's nothing spectacular about that. No one's going to write it. There's, you know, Sports Illustrated isn't going to show up and go, wow, look at what this guy did. He resisted temptation by, through prayer and fasting and reading the Word of God. Amazing. But nonetheless, that escape is there, isn't it? That's the promise from the Word of God. That is the shield that we have. The Bible says the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it, into it and, and is safe. You know, the words of God are a shield. They're a strong tower. If we run to these things, we will be sheltered. But we have to believe that. We have to have that faith to trust that in the word of God. So yes, it's an offensive weapon, but it's also a shelter. Say, well, I, you know, that's probably true, but I don't need it. Well, you'll probably be the first to go. <laughs> you'll be the first sucker that gets taken out. <laughs> Because we need protection. People that think that just, oh, I'm, I'm six feet tall and bulletproof. The devil's not going to get me. You're the first one he's going to get. Oh, that battle's not as real as he's trying to make it out to be. Yes, it is. It's very real. It's a spiritual, just because we can't see it. But we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. <clears throat> we must believe that there is a need for this protection. We must believe that there really is a battle going on because the Bible tells us there is. And we must pick up this sword and swing it. And you know what? There's times where we need to pick up the shield and use that, then we need to do that. And sometimes, you know, that involves some humility. But the Bible says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So why do you need to pick up the sword? Because there's a real battle. It's real. And God has given us a spiritual weapon tonight. It's one that can and must be trusted so let's wield it by faith to deliver others, to deliver those, the lost that are out there, and also to deliver our own selves. When the, battle come, when, the, when the devil comes after us, we can pick up that shield. Let's deliver ourselves from what? From, from the enemy that we have, that roaring lion that is walking about. So we can see how the Bible, you know, it's likened to a lot of different things, isn't it? A lot of things are very encouraging. A lot of things are very motivating. You know, but this is, this is a particular thing that the, you know, be, the Bible likening, being likened unto a sword and shield, you know, it can be a little alarming, really, when you think about it, to think that, wow, we're really involved in this, you know, eternal spiritual struggle between God and the devil. We're kind of right in the middle of it, and we're these instruments that, we're the soldiers that are fighting for one side or the other. Yeah, it's kind of intense, but, you know, it's also kind of exciting. You know, the Christian life isn't just some drudgery that we go through. You know, the Christian life is, is a, an exciting battle. It, it's something that, you know, we get, to, we get to see great victories. And you know what? Along the way, we're probably going to see some casualties, casualties too. Let's just make sure we're not the casualty. You know, let's just make sure that we're the ones that are on the front lines, picking up the sword, picking up the shield, putting on the armor of God, and taking it to the enemy. Let's go ahead and pray.